There have been significant campaigns to stop people smoking. As science has shown, there is now no doubt that smoking harms nearly every organ of the body. We can learn a lot from these past campaigns, which raises a key question. How has science traditionally been communicated? Well, science communication as a discipline began around the 1990s. And one of the key early theories of science communication is what is known as the information deficit model. The deficit model says there is certain scientific knowledge that the public should know. And if they don't know it, they need to, they need to know it. And so somehow we have to educate the public in this knowledge. We can think about the deficit model like this. That scientific knowledge is inherently worth knowing that the public should listen to scientists and that the best way to convince people is to provide more scientific facts. We know from lots of evidence that the deficit model doesn't work, that if you try to, you know, see people as just blank slates waiting to be filled up with information that will then suddenly change their behaviour, um, we know that th th that doesn't change their behaviour. The deficit model carries with it this connotation that people are lacking. They lack knowledge that they should have. The assumption that divisions on social consensus can be alleviated by flooding people with more information has been shown to be problematic on a whole range of issues. We've already discussed tobacco, but so too climate change and vaccination. On all of these issues, the facts alone just haven't convinced people to take action. In response, science communicators sought another path trying to get people to think more like scientists. This assumption sees a lack of scientific thinking as both the problem and the solution to current division. The argued solution then is a public who think more scientifically, who understand both the methods and principles of science and who is able to discern scientific credibility. The only way to figure out if that's what's going on is to collect some data. I, mean, I think scientists would agree. Um, in a study we did, um, we found that uh, the people who were the most polarized on uh, climate change, on the risks, were the ones who were the, the most science literate, um, also the most numerate. And so as people become more science literate, they don't, be, they don't start to think more about the issue in the way that scientists do. They just become more reliable kind of indicators of, of what people like them think. Now this isn't to say that we shouldn't promote scientific literacy. We should promote science literacy because it's, it's intrinsically worthwhile and because people who are science literate can do all kinds of things better for themselves and for others if they're science literate. It's a separate question though whether that a deficit in science literacy was the problem or that more, of, more science literacy would solve it. You know, I think the answer to that is no. There, there was a study in the 1950s and what they showed is that uh, they took students from two uh, colleges and they showed them the film of a football game, American football game, and they said, the official made some controversial calls. Watch the tape and see whether he made the right call. And of course, the students from one school thought he was out to do their team in. He's making all these mistakes, calling penalties on us. And the students from the other school said, oh, he, he was biased against us and trying to help the other team. And this is this phenomenon of motivated reasoning. The stake that people have in these groups that are really important to them emotionally can affect what they see. Once we believe in something, we're significantly more likely to filter out evidence or, or, or give more weight to evidence that confirms that than, than something that, 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 that opposes them. And we all do that. If we like it or not, it doesn't matter how objective we think we are, we all do that to a degree. This points to the role that science communicators and science communication researchers have played in attempting to convince significant sections of the public of both the reality and gravity of many of these key complex issues. It really asks the question, what have we been doing wrong? I mean, part of the problem we can run into is not realising that doing valid science does not communicate its validity. The burden is to some degree on, on, the, on, on the practitioner community who have very often taken, as I said, intuitive approach. Mickey Mantle, the great baseball player, he didn't like in between innings or during the game climb into the, the radio booth and start doing play by play. Um, he did baseball. Somebody else communicated what he was doing, right? Somebody, a scientist does science. Um, communicating and doing are completely different things. 
some criticism also goes to the social science side of things. Um, the, the social science that very often has has done research for the sake of doing research, basic social science research, and has not necessarily thought all that much about addressing larger societal problems or maybe addressing the needs of the practitioner community. The use of blind intuition and an unscientific approach to how we communicate has impeded success. I mean, we actually do know a good amount about science communication. Um, and, you know, it isn't the case that we only started so studying science communication scientifically when climate change happened. It was studied for 30 years. I mean, people looked at the same issue when it was nuclear power 30 years ago.